You're listening to The Hikam with Sheikh Zahir Bekas of the Lotri Foundation. In this podcast, Sheikh Zahir explains the aphorisms from Ibn Atta al-Laz Fim's Book of Wisdoms, Al-Hikam al-Ata'iyya, a classical manual of spiritual development. Visit secretshub.org for online courses, our reliable answer service, and engaging media. <laughs> ونحن بما علمتنا وزلنا علما بفضلك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وصلم آمين. So uh, continue. Someone asked me a question yesterday after we finished this <coughs> after we finished the hikma yesterday. Uh, someone asked me the question about uh, knowledge. Uh, yesterday's hikmah was uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Ibn Atah, Shaykh Ibn Atah, he says it is not feared that the paths uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that the path is going or paths are going to confuse you. However, he said, what is feared is that your whims are going to overtake you. What is feared is that your hawa is going to, uh, what you should fear is that your hawa is going to come to uh, take you away from the, uh, from the pathways uh, themselves. They, they are the things that will defeat you if you follow your hawa, your whims. And so how is it that, uh, that the paths uh, is not going to de- is not going to defeat you. He said yesterday, as the commentators they say, is that the path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is very clear. The Sirat al Mustaqim is very clear. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, as we said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Wa hadha Sirat al Rabbika," and this is the way of your Lord. This is the path of your Lord. Al Mustaqima, that is straight. This is the way of your Lord, the straight path. Qad fasalna al ayat, and then Allah says, and we have detailed the signs, we have detailed our revelation, meaning the Quran. We have put in it sufficient detail or detailed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so that you are, so that you know how to navigate this world. So that you know how to navigate it. You know what is wrong and you know what is right. You know what will lead to success and you will know and you know what will lead to your disaster or doom. Hmm? But however, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Li yatadhakkarun. It's for the people Qad Fasalna Ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Li Qaumi Yatadhakkarun that we have detailed the made detailed the revelation, the Quran, as even a basset of the ayah, and the ayat here is referring directly to the Quran. We have made the Quran detailed enough so that you know uh, how to navigate. So that what happens that those who can take heed and are remindful, and those who uh, people who understand can navigate and that can know they're not confused hmm, by what to do and what not to do. They're not confused by the halal or by the haram. The haram is the halal is clear and the haram is clear. Allah subhanahu the Prophet this is what he tells us. He tells us this Al Halal Bayunun Wal Haram Bayunun Wa Bainahuma Umurun Mutashabihat O بَيْنَهُمَ uh, أُمُورٌ or بَيْنَهُمَ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ and between them Allah subhanahu wa the Prophet والسلام, he says that the halal is clear what is permissible is clear what is impermissible is also very clear between the two between the halal, the permissible and the impermissible are mutashabihat are the things that are unclear the things that are unclear the things that could fall you closer to the haram or the things that could fall you closer to halal. 
the makruhat can be in the mutashabihat, the things that are uh, that lead you to can lead you to fall into one of the other categories, especially the haram categories. So beware of those mutashabihat and stick to the things that are clear. Stick to the things that are clear. So the questioner asks, how do you know what is clear amongst all of the opinions that are out there? How do you know? How, do you, how would one navigate themselves to avoid the, the gray matters, the mutashabihat, and adhere to the halal? Adhere to the halal. How does one navigate amongst all of the opinions that are out there? That you can navigate by seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge from the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that are in awe and they humble themselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking knowledge from the rightful possessors of knowledge in which the Prophet also said, Al ulama warathut al anbiya, that the ulama, the scholars, the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. They inherit. What do they inherit? They inherit knowledge from the Prophets. That's what they inherit. They don't inherit uh, their wealth. The, the ulama don't inherit wealth because they're not related. The ulama do not inherit nabuwa. They don't inherit prophethood. They don't. Because that is God-given. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who chooses and selects and elects. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do they inherit? They inherit knowledge. That's what they inherit. So the Prophet ﷺ made it clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear. So how is it that, how can one distinguish amongst all of the opinions that are out there how does one distinguish the truth from not? That is based on finding those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says are truly in awe or truly who are humbled, who have humility, scholars of humility, who are the people of humility when it comes to knowledge. Who are the people of humility? They are the people who fear to answer you. You want to, the people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the scholars who have humility, they are the ones who are terrified at answering questions. They're terrified. Why are they terrified? Because they know that if, you, if they answer a question, they have to be very certain about the answer. Very certain. Because if they say something that is not right, if they say something that is not right, then they're answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, have, they, they know that answering someone's question is an amano, is an amano, is a trust. And that that trust, if when it's fulfilled and you answer their question, that what happens is that you are now putting yourself to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning how you led them or what you said to them. And they may not be a matter of, well, you got the, the question wrong, or the, you got the answer wrong. It could be the way that they understand it. The way that they understand it. You will have to, the, the ones who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from amongst the scholars, are the ones who try to clarify the questions before they answer. They clarify the questions before they answer. So that there is no ambiguity. There's no uncertainty in the question from their understanding of the question. So that they, the answer becomes clear. So if something is a wajib, it's said this is a must. Or it should be done. And if something is not a wajib, then it's something that is permissible and merely can be done. So their words are, are chosen very well. They're not loose. They're not loosely chosen. The words are chosen very well. These are from people who have humility, people of knowledge of humility, people of knowledge who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Shafi rahmatullahi he was once asked a question. 
Shafi Rahmatullah, he once once asked a question with people around him. And he didn't answer. He didn't answer the questioner. And the person waited. And then after a while, the person responded. The person asked again. He repeated the question again to the Imam, to Imam Shafi Rahmatullah. And he again waited. One of the persons asked the Imam about the question. And he responded then. He said that he had waited because he wanted to determine whether the answer was going to be of benefit to the person or detriment. He wanted to know and determine whether the answer that he was going to give was going to benefit the person or cause him detriment. Cause him detriment. Obviously, it would not be a question of whether, one, whether something is a fard or not, because that would be answered. That would be answered. But determining, determining how you talk to people, what you give to people, how you say things to people, is very important. Because you can lead people to, depending on who you speak to or who you answer, it can lead to someone being the dean becoming hard on them. It can be. It can. Someone who is struggling in their faith and you don't understand of their struggle and you tell them something. The dean can be overwhelming to them, in which case they may give up in their practice or in their path of wanting to better themselves as believers, if it becomes overwhelming to them. And someone who understands the questioner and understands the question will be able to ascertain how to answer the question. How to answer the question. And so the one aspect of, uh, of scholars to discern which opinions to take is to ascertain, is to feel what that scholar or what that person, what is their akhlaq, what is their adab? Do they have humility? Is it a place of humility that they answer question? Or do they rush to answer? Do they rush to answer? Or do they opinionize? The scholars never opinionized. They never say, this is what I believe, this is what I think. Scholars of humility, they never say, I think this. No. Before they answer, they are certain. They will not answer unless they're certain. Because our deen, our, our, our religion does not have any room for speculation. It doesn't. Our religion does not have any room for speculation. It doesn't. Because Jannah is clear and Jahannam is clear. What you do in order to get into Jannah is very clear. And the things that you have to do or not, to, or not do to get into Jahannam is very clear also. So there's no room in our faith for speculation. There isn't. There's no room in our faith for mere speculation. There's no room for it. There is work and there is... Uh, effort that is made, effort that is made, ijtihad that is made in order to answer a question by those who possess the knowledge of making it. Those who possess the knowledge of making it. The second way that scholars are distinct, discernible, who are humble, who have awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is they're not afraid to not answer you. They're not afraid to not give you an answer. Or they're not afraid to say to you that I don't know. They're not afraid. Imam Malik, rahmatullahi, and we quote the great imams, the scholars. Why? Because this, is, this tells you something about themselves. It tells you something about themselves. What the Imam Malik, rahmatullahi, he says, one of his famous statements is that he said, Nusful ilm fi kalimatain. He said that half of knowledge 
is contained in two words. Half of knowledge is contained in two words. Those two words in Arabic is la adri. Half of knowledge is contained in two words. What are the two words? I don't know. Hmm? I don't know. Half of knowledge. Why is it half of knowledge? Why is half of knowledge is that the person recognizes, the person of, of, of scholarly rank, what do they recognize? They recognize deficiency within themselves. They recognize that they don't know. There are things that they don't know. They recognize that the path of knowledge is a path that is a path that never ends. It's a path that never ends. You will, as if you take to, to know or to come to study or come to know the deen, it is a path that never ends. It's a path that never ends. Because there's always something to learn. There's always something to learn. There's always an understanding to gain. There's always an understanding to gain. There's always a, a insight to acquire or, Allah, or an insight that Allah will bring to you. An insight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring to you. Hmm? So, and this was the way of the companions. This is the way of the companions. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he was a khalifa, he was traveling. He was traveling outside of the city of Medina. And he was encamped outside of a village. And he heard a, one of the village, one of the, one of the women of the village. She was calling her son. She heard him call her son. In one of the Qurayshi dialects. And he said at that moment, when he heard what she said, she said to him, he said to his companions, now I understand what that word means in this ayah. Now I understand. What did he gain? When this is when he was the Khalifa. He heard the Prophet Sallallahu He heard the ayahs of Quran given by the Prophet Sallallahu hmm? But when did he gain an understanding? Gain the understanding after after Allah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called back the Prophet Sallallahu that's when he gained an understanding. And he gained the understanding because he left himself open to learn. He left himself open to learn. So he left himself open to learn. One has to leave oneself open to always learn. No one who is humble should think that they know everything. No one. No one should think that they know everything of the faith. Because this was not the way of our, of our predecessors. It was not the way of the Salaf. It was not the way of those who preceded, who came after, who became before the Tabi'een, before the scholars of today. And it was not the way of the followers, of the companions and their followers, and so on down. And so the path that Sheikh Ibn Atayla is talking about that is not fear that the paths are going to confuse you because the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear. The path of practice is clear. The path of practice is clear. And you leave open. What do you leave open? You leave open on that there's understandings that or knowledge that you don't have. That's what you leave open. That there are things that you don't know. That you don't know. There's insights that you need to gain or that can be gained if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it to occur or wills it for you. There are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring and he determines when to bring it. But you have to be a sincere seeker for it and you cannot close your mind or your heart. You should never close your mind and your heart that you know or you possess everything that there is to possess that you should close your mind to it. This is how the paths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that it won't confuse you. It won't. Because your heart is open to learn. Your heart is open to learn. 
And if your heart is open to learn with sincerity, then that sincerity will be it will you'll be able to distinguish between something that is said that is right and something that is said that is wrong. Something that is said that is right, something that is said is wrong. There are too many opinions today. Too many. People love to give their opinions. They love to give their opinions. The best of the scholars today are those of the scholars who who uh, who are able to quote from the scholars of the past because that's their fear. Their fear is to opinionize themselves. That's their fear. And so they quote from the past. They quote from the, uh, from the scholars of the past. They give the opinions of the scholars of the past. They quote the great mufassirs. They, grow, they quote the great scholars of, of Quran. The great scholars of Quran. If one wants to know what, what is in the Quran or the explanation of Quran, one should seek it from the scholars of Quran of the past. If one wants to know an opinion of a hadith or what a hadith means, then one should look at the great muhaddiths, the great scholars of hadith. One looks at the great scholars of hadith. One wants to know about a certain matter of fiqh, of jurisprudence. What does one do? One look at the great scholars of fiqh. What have they said? What have they said? What have they said? One wants to teach, one wants to understand Quranic ayat, look at the narrations that are there in the hadith. Most of the hadith collection, if not all of them, they have a chapter on tafsir. Most of the hadith collection, including Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, most of them have a chapter on tafsir. Most of them they have a chapter on tafsir. What did the Prophet explain about this ayah? What is the context of this ayah? What is Asbab al Nuzul? How did the ayah come down? What circumstance did it come down in? What did the ayah address? What situation did it address? What problem did it solve? What problems did it solve? This ayah that came down. What did it solve? So the hadith are, are, are sought in themselves to explain what has come in the Qur'an. What did the Prophet say? What did his companions say? What is it that his companions explained? Ibn Abbas has, has their collections that collect the statements of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Huma of what he said the ayah means, the, uh, the particular verses of Qur'an. Not all of them, some, what they mean. So if one wants to have a true understanding, one goes back to the people of the past. There, so then one does not speculate. There's too many speculation today. Too many. And so and the speculation can confuse one. Shaykh Ibn Ta'illah is not talking about that. That is not fear that the turuq, that the pathways to Allah is going to confuse you. No, it's not going to confuse you if you seek the people of humility. If you seek people of humility to ask your question. They are the ones who fear to answer because they do not want to be put as responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the answer that they gave you. They do not want that responsibility. They don't. They don't seek it, nor they go after it. Today, people are the opposite. They seek the amana. People in the past never sought this amana. They ran away from it. They ran away from positions of authority. They ran away from being put as a qadi. They ran away from people calling them mufti. They ran away from, uh, from being uh, in a position in which they would deal with zakat. They ran away from being in a position of, uh, of people looking up at them to decide things. They ran away. They did not want those amana. They did not want those amanat. They did not want them. Because the more that you have, 
the more you will be answered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. It's like Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was very well to do in Mecca. Then when he left with the Prophet ﷺ, when they left and they migrated to Medina, he left everything. He went to, he went to Medina and he got uh, his, the, the one that he was connected to, the Ansar, gave him half, was going to give him half of his wealth, give him half of what he has, and give him one of his wives. And he said, no. He said, just give me, he gave him a, a dinar, one single dinar dirham. And so he went to the marketplace and he, he made a trade with that. And he became extremely rich. He's one of the richest of the companions. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. One day in Medina, he is they are there. One day in Medina, after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there is a uh, there was a a uh, like a thunder, like an earthquake in Medina. And so the companions wonder what was happening. Aisha radiallahu, radiallahu anha, she came out. And it was said to her that this was a caravan coming. This was a caravan coming from Syria, bringing goods into Medina. And the caravan had spanned about a hundred camels. It went from the interior of Medina to the outskirts of Medina. And she said, whose caravan, she, whose caravan it is? She said, is the caravan of Abdurrahman bin Auf, radiallahu anhu, that he had went and that he had brought back goods to sell. He brought back, he was a trader, he was a merchant. She said to, she said, and then it was conveyed to him. She said that the ones who are affluent will be crawling into Jannah. The ones who are affluent will be crawling into Jannah. Crawling. So it got back to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And so he came and he saw her. He came and he saw her. And this was Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu who fought with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Badr. He fought with the Prophet at Uhud. He had fought. This is, this is, this is, subhanAllah, this is uh, Ashra Mubashireen. One of them who was promised Jannah. Hmm? He comes and he sees her. And he says to her, he says, when you said, what you said, he said, I instantly remembered what the Prophet ﷺ had said. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? That the one who is affluent will crawl into Jannah. Why will they crawl into Jannah? Because Allah subhanahu will make them account for every single dollar that they had. The amana of money, you will have to account for it. What are you accounting for? That you knew how much you had, and you paid zakat correctly. That you know how much you had, and that you accounted it when you went to pay zakat. And that you did, and that you earned it, and that you earned it rightfully. You're accounting before Allah, that you earned it correctly. That every penny that you earned it correctly, and that you spent it correctly, and that you gave it correctly, and that you had the proper intention when you gave it, that you gave it. So because of that reckoning, they will be crawling into Jannah. They'll, they'll take their time going into Jannah. What did he do, Abdul Rahman bin Awf radiallahu What did he do? He gave it all away. The entire caravan he gave away. He donated the entire thing. The entire thing. Because he was fearful of the accounting. Fearful of it. These were the companions. They did not want a mano. They did not want to take trust. They did not take. People fight over trust today. They want leadership. They want this. They want that. They want to be answer questions. They want directorships of masjid. They want to be in charge of masjids. All that has a manna on it. They all have trust on it. You take on a trust, you're answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for how you, how you deal with it and how you uh, dispatch it. You'll be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
then we have enough to be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our own selves, much less for other people. We have enough to be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. This is the way of the Prophet. So the paths that Shaykh Ibn Ta'ala is talking about that are not, is not fear that it will confuse you, is the path that is clear. Stick to what is clear. Stick to scholarship that is clear. Stick to the scholars of humility and humbleness. And you won't go, uh, you're not going to go astray because they're there because they are fearful for what they say. They fear every word that they say. They're fearful of it because they know that one day they'll have to answer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And so they don't opinionize nor do they speculate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Forgive us, have mercy upon us, forgive our elders, our parents, give them good health and long life. Those who are alive, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good health and long life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to serve them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to serve our parents, our elders, help us to take care of them, help us to enter Jannah by our service to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have passed away, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them his mercy, his makfir, and his shade. On that day when there's no shade except his, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their graves spacious and wide. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put nur in their graves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help elevate them in the next world and enter Jannah to Firdaus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children, keep on the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge and practice of our deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and forgive us. Have mercy upon us, all of our brothers and our sisters faced with difficulties faced with uh, oppression. May Allah subhanahu wa lift the hands of the oppressor from them, secure them in their homelands, feed them and clothe them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. All those who are faced with difficulties, may Allah subhanahu wa remove their difficulties, bring ease to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to, may Allah subhanahu wa inspire us to help them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us to be of service to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for helping us to service them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make our homes from amongst the homes of the believers, make our last words our very best words. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, shara wa na ilaha wa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you for listening to The Hikam with Shaykh Zahir Bekas. Help Seekers Hub spread the light of guidance to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.